Okay. Let's get started. Good evening and welcome to uh, Sibley Auditorium here on the campus of uh, UC Berkeley. My name is Paul Callas. I'm an astrophysicist here and I will be the moderator for this evening's extraordinary event. Tonight we will consider the following question. In our galaxy, which contains 200 billion stars or more, is the sun the only star with a planet with a technological civilization? Are we alone? We've actually been asking this question for thousands of years. I know that Democritus, an ancient Greek philosopher in 400 BC, wrote there, that there must be innumerable worlds in this universe. But to study the same question now in a modern scientific context, we have for you tonight a debate between two leading scientists. Jeff Marcy, there in the black jacket, <laughs> is known... <laughs> Jeff Marcy is known worldwide, actually, uh, for having discovered a very large number of planets. At least 200 planets have been discovered by Jeff Marcy and his co-workers. These planets are what people call extrasolar planets. Uh, most of these extrasolar planets are currently thought to be much like our own gas giant planets. But right now he's directly involved in several projects which over the next few years will reveal planets around other stars much like our own Earth. Dan Wertheimer in the light jacket uh, directs Berkeley's SETI program and is the chief scientist for the SETI at Home project. SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. The SETI at Home project uses the largest telescope we have on the planet, the giant radio dish in Puerto Rico called Arecibo. Uh, it also uh, gets the help of millions of volunteers around the world to analyze the data and search for radio signals from other civilizations. So please join me in welcoming our two speakers. So this is the format for tonight's debate. Each scientist has 15 minutes to present their views. Then each will have five minutes to reply. Afterwards, the floor will be open to you, and you can ask them questions. Before we start, I'd like everybody to check their mobile phones, make sure they're silenced, and we'll begin with uh, Dan Wertheimer. Dan. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, so I want to talk to you about this question, are we alone? Um, before I start, I just want to mention, if you're interested in these kind of talks, we have a, a monthly science series here at Berkeley uh, the third Saturday of every month, and there's a website you can go to, or if you can't write that down, just go to the astronomy department website, and you can learn about all these different talks that are going on at Berkeley, different science every month. I want to start <laughs> by uh, discrediting my opponent, Jeff. This is common in political circles. Jeff, Jeff um, denies this now, but in 1996, uh, he, <laughs> according to the world, Worthy News, uh, and I remember this, he admitted that he was an alien. And now he doesn't, he denies this, of course, because it would, uh, then I would win the battle uh, tonight. And uh, a lot, you know, Jeff is famous for finding planets. A lot of people think that he didn't actually use Earth technology to find planets because he came from an advanced civilization. He, he knew where all these planets were. So the, uh, on a little more serious note, the topics that I want to talk about tonight uh, the Drake equation, which is a way to calculate the number of civilizations of the galaxy, and I'll introduce you to the equation, and the rare Earth hypothesis, which uh, is a hypothesis that says the Earth is incredibly unusual, there are no other planets like it, uh, and I'll tell you why I think that's probably wrong. And then I'll, I want to tell you a little bit about SETI, and Jeff is going to say, Dan, you've been searching for 30 years and you haven't found anything, therefore there's no ET, uh, you're wasting your time, and I'm going to tell you why that's not true. And then Jeff and I probably talk a little bit about the Fermi paradox, which was Enrico Fermi said, um, kind of famously, hey, if there are these advanced civilizations out there that are billion years ahead of us, 
then surely they can do space travel and they'd be zooming around the universe and why haven't we seen them? And I'll tell you a little bit about the way out of that Fermi paradox. So let me start with the Drake equation. The Drake equation is a way to calculate the number of civilizations that we could communicate with in the galaxy. Uh, and n there on the left is the number of civilizations. And then all you have to do is multiply all those parameters together. And the problem with the Drake equation is we have no idea what any of those parameters are. The, I'll, I'll show you a little bit about how the, this equation works. Is it's a whittling down process. You start with the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. There are a couple hundred billion stars, maybe 400 billion stars, a lot of stars. And then you say, well, of those stars, what fraction of those stars have planets going around them? And Jeff can tell you about that. He's the world's expert on planets going around stars. Um, and, and then and, and sort of how many planets are going around stars. And then of those planets, the next factor is of those planets, which planets have the right, how many of those have the right environments for life? Do they have liquid water? Do they have the right temperature? They have all the things you need to get started, get life started. And once you, uh, once you have a nice planet uh, with a nice temperature and the right environment, the next, fraction, the next thing is, how, what fraction does life actually get started? So if you have a good planet, does life, evolve, does life pop up right away? Is it an easy process? On Earth, it didn't take very long for life to pop up. Um, and uh, the, as, pretty much as soon as the Earth cooled down, within the first few hundred million years of Earth's history, life popped up. And so even though we don't understand the details of the process, um, it, it, because it happened here quickly, some people think it'll happen um, in, in other places. And uh, I. I think maybe Jeff agrees with you here, but my guess is the universe is teeming with primitive life, that primitive life is a pretty easy thing. There are organic compounds are all over the place. There's going to be a lot of places where you can get life started. But then the Drake equation gets more and more uncertain as you go to the right of this equation. Once you get life started, the next question is, it, once you have primitive life, do you get intelligent life? Does it evolve and become intelligent? On Earth, that happened, um, there's uh, something we call convergent evolution, and a lot of different paths became intelligent. Um, Simon Morris has written a lot about this. Um, people used to think that, um, that intelligence was, was kind of a rare thing, but I think now there's a, more of a consensus in the community that, and, well, if you start off with simple life, the only way it can go is to get more intelligence. And in some evolutionary <laughs> niches, it's going to be advantageous uh, evolutionary speaking, to, to have, be intelligent. Not always is it going to be advantageous. Sometimes it's going to be more advantageous to be faster or, or have harder shells or something. But there are going to be some evolu evolutionary niches on the planet where intelligence is going to be good. And, and so I think intelligence is going to arise. It's not clear how fast it's going to arise and, and what conditions are going to arise. But the next factor is once you get intelligent creatures, what fraction of those creatures develop communication? Do they develop uh, technology that we could use to communicate with them? Do they have lasers? Do they have radio? Or some way that we can find out if they're out there and maybe communicate with them? That, that, of course, we have no idea. The last factor is the longevity of the civilization. So once they develop high technology, lasers, radio signals, um, ways that we could communicate, they might also develop nuclear weapons, biological weapons. And maybe they blow themselves up. Uh, now, maybe not. Maybe there's kind of a bottleneck that civilizations go through where they might blow themselves up or they might not. And uh, if they do kind of get through that bottleneck and learn to live together, um, then they could last a long time. So our sun is 5 billion years old. It's going to last another few billion years. So we could go on for, uh, we could have very long lasting civilizations. And some stars are 10 billion years old. And so uh, you can imagine very advanced civilizations out there. And my guess is that if we ever do get in contact with, with, advan with civilizations, they are going to be more advanced. It's hard to find the primitive civilizations. It's hard to find them if they're trees and bacteria. It's going to be hard to find them if they're just at our level. We're kind of an emerging civilization. We've just learned how we might communicate with other civilizations. Um, but civilizations a billion years up on us might be the kind of first civilizations we get in contact with. So um, Jeff is a modest guy, and I'm, I'm worried that he may not tell you about these fantastic discoveries that he's made about planets. So I just want to tell you a little bit about this. This is, if you'd asked me 15 years, are you going to tell us about this, Jeff? No. So if, if you'd asked, <laughs> if you'd asked astronomers 15 years ago, are there planets going around other stars? We would have said, well, we think so, but we don't know for sure. But thanks to Jeff and his colleagues, um, uh, hundreds of planets have been discovered.